All right, good morning. We are in 2 Kings, chapter 6 this morning. And we have two different stories that we're going to look at. One is what I call one of those pop-in stories that just stands alone, makes an illustration, but really doesn't connect anything else that's really in the narrative. So we're going to take a look at that. One of the most astounding things, and we're going to talk about that this morning before we have our discussion, that you see throughout Scripture and even throughout today is people challenging God and thinking they're going to come out on top. <laughs> uh, you think of the story of Moses and Abiram and in the rebellion of Abiram, Korah, and Dathan. After all the miracles, right? After the opening of the Red Sea, after the manna coming down from heaven, all this stuff, Abiram's going to challenge Moses for the leadership of Israel. That makes no sense. I mean, it'd be one thing if there was no evidence, right? It would be if you didn't see all these miracles. And uh, the people saw Moses go up on top of you know, Mount Sinai, and there's you know, lightning, and there's you know, like smoke on top of it, and he comes down, and his face is all shining, and Byron's going to challenge him for leadership. And of course, uh, Part of those in the rebellion, the earth swallows up and, sw and swallows them and fire comes down and kills a bunch of others. It's not a good idea to challenge God. Not, uh, in, in, right? You're not going to come out on top if you challenge God. We're going to see uh, this as part of the uh, uh, narrative in the second part of what we're going to read here. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, And the sons of the prophets uh, said to Elijah, Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may be able to dwell. So he answered, Go. And then one said, Please consent to go with your servants and he said I will go and so he went with them and when they came to the Jordan they cut down trees but as one was cutting down a tree the iron axe head fell into the water and he cried out and said ah alas master for it was borrowed so the man of God said where did it fall and he showed him the, the place so he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Verse 8, And now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be at such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told them. And thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> All right, we'll get to this second story in a, in a minute. But now we have this floating axe head. Uh, this is a rather mundane scene. There's a hundred prophets. We saw that in the last section. And they said, you know, we're getting kind of crowded here. <laughs> this place can't hold us all. It's not enough room for us. There's too many of us. So the prophets come to Elijah and they ask Elijah permission to go to the Jordan and fell some trees to make new homes for themselves to dwell by the Jordan. Now Elijah 
Why did they ask Elijah? Well, Elijah's obviously God's leader. The hand of God's on him. They recognize that. Uh, and so they recognize that of all the prophets there, God is using Elijah in a very special way. And so they re it's important to recognize the leaders that God has placed before us and to be able to submit to that leadership. Uh, there was, by the way, in the, in the kingdom of God, there's no room for jealousy or rivalry. If we're doing the Lord's work, we're in it together, right? And so there's, if the Lord appoints someone to be a leader, we'll praise the Lord, right? If, you know, if he's the one. And now if someone presumes to take on himself the leadership and he's not told to, it's going to be a disaster. So they recognize Elisha as a leader. And apparently the prophets, now, now this, I, you know, I've done a little research and there's really nothing out there. I mean, today, try to go down to uh, you know, Patuxent River Park and start failing trees and <laughs> say, well, I need to build a house. Well, <clears throat> And that won't work because every piece of land in this country is owned by someone, right? Uh, do you know who owns really Wyoming and Idaho and Nevada? Uh, exactly right. The Bureau of Land, uh, you know, BLM, right? The, uh, the Bureau of Lands and, and Mines yeah. Management. That's why Bureau of Lands Management. 87% of what, Utah and you know, uh, almost 93% of Nevada, I mean, they, they owned by federal government, you know. And so uh, how they can go down here, the laws must have been different. They go down in Jordan, they just start cutting down trees. Uh, the National Capital Park and Planning Commission doesn't come down and say, hey, you can't do that, we're gonna find you. I mean, and they're gonna build homes there. So apparently there was public land or something that they felt they can do that. Um, they were using axes, uh, chainsaws hadn't come around yet, you know. And they must have been very, very, very near the water. There's, there's two things I want to mention here about that. <clears throat> when we go to Israel, there, there's trees around where the water flows, and otherwise you don't get a lot. <laughs> And so they have to be near the Jordan, they have to be near the Sea of Galilee to actually get, you know, some forest land. Uh, if you take a look at their uh, mountains, it's all barren. I mean, it's, you hardly can find anything growing on it, you know. And so, so this is where, where the lush land is, is where the Jordan is flowing. And so they go down there and, and uh, they're chopping a tree and the axe head flies off and lands into the river. <laughs> now the prophet could not afford his own axe, so this axe was borrowed, right? And so he'd be responsible to return it. And so he cries out, oh, you know, my, my lord, my master, you know, this, this was a borrowed axe. And they might notice, so I just returned the handle, right? I mean, just uh, might notice. And so Elisha uh, throws a stick in the water and the iron axe head floats, which just goes against nature, right? I mean, iron axe heads don't float to the top. They're denser than water by quite a bit. Now the stick is a what? Well, it's a prop. Another, remember we talked about these props. The stick had nothing to do with it. It's just an indication and, and one of the things these props do is it indicates that God is doing this by some kind of physical manifestation. So the axe head floats, reach out and pick up the axe head. Uh, I don't know of any other place in history where you had an axe head floating. <laughs> uh, iron only floats if you have the buoyancy in it, like in a battleship or something, the air and stuff like that, but we won't get into that. You have several of these, don't you, in scriptures? where you have God define the laws of nature, right? I mean, he set up the laws of nature so he can defy it if he wants to, right? For example, when the sun stands still, right, in Joshua's day, not normal, you know, you have, you have physicists blowing their minds. Oh, you know, things would go off, you wouldn't have gravity, you know, everything. Well, 
if God can create the universe, he can make the sun stand still. And guess what? He can keep everything else flowing. I mean, this is God, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, when Moses opens the Red Sea, well, Moses didn't open the Red Sea. Obviously, God used him as a prop, right? Red Sea opens. That's not usual. That's not normal. Uh, that would have been quite an experience, a walk between two large walls of water <laughs> across there. And so, uh, and it wasn't a, a short walk, like from here down to the gym or something. This is quite a little walk across there. Uh, the Valley of the Dry Bones. I, I, I love Ezekiel's response there, uh, Ezekiel 37. God says, can these bones live? Obviously, it was where a great battle was. They'd all die. Can the, Son of man, can these bones live? And he hedges his bets. He says, uh, only you know, Lord. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you have a bone coming to bone and sinew, sinew. Now, there's a big debate whether that actually happened or it was a vision, you know. I'm not here to debate that, but obviously that would not be normal. And all of a sudden, life is breathed into them. Jesus walking on water. We're not talking about ice, right? We're talking about actually walking on water. Defies uh, nature. He wasn't on a paddleboard or anything. He was actually walking on the water. And uh, Jesus calming the storm. Peace be still. And all of a sudden, what? Storm just stops right, right there. That's, un, that's, that's unnatural. Uh, he takes that boy's lunch and does what? He multiplies the, the fish and, and, and the thing. I mean, it was, he replicated that out of, out of nothing just by his command. He just replicates this. Uh, raising the dead. <laughs> Not natural. You know, where you have the, the widow's son, the, the widow of Nain, her son, and then, of course, Lazarus. So there's a lot of these places throughout Scripture. By the way, I think it's a little bit unusual for Balaam's donkey to talk, too. I mean, you know, it's uh, a little, and, and it was really kind of an interesting thing when Balaam starts holding a conversation with his donkey as if he does it every day. And so here we have these unusual events. This is a personal benefit to the prophet, obviously, that lost the ax. Uh, God gives aid. He cares about, you know, what these prophets are doing. Is another confirmation of Elisha's call. Other than that, this is just an isolated story of another miracle that God's doing, just an example of what God can do. But I think it leads into the next narrative is the fact that there is a God and that God still rules the universe. And by the way, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, to me, a verse that's become more and more meaningful to me is in Matthew 24, uh, when we see these thing, evil things happening, and there's wars and rumors of wars, and, 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 and evil men doing evil things, and, and, and just the destruction we see. He said, don't let your heart be troubled when you see these things. These must be, because the birthing of the kingdom is like a woman giving birth and labor. And these are labor pains. So what we're seeing, not that we're not to oppose it, right? But what he said, don't, don't be troubled by this. I got everything in control. Uh, you know, going back to the Habakkuk illustration, he said, Lord, don't you notice it? Oh, yeah, I, I got it all. I got it under control. So when we see these things in the hearts of men growing cold, which is also in Matthew 24, God's saying, don't worry about these things. I got all this under control. Okay. Now we have a point of a Syrian king. Now the first thing I need to mention about this Syrian king is I don't know if it's the same king that Naaman was serving. We're not told, right? Uh, the kings, uh, you know, you have a series of kings called Ben-Hadad. You're going to get a Hazel here. But it, 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 they're kind of titles. So we don't know which king this is. A Syrian king decides to attack Israel's army and try to raid Israel, you know. Uh, kings tend to want three things. They want power. They want prowess, people to fear them. And they want possessions. <laughs> and so 
they, instead of staying within their border and being content to rule their people, they want to expand, they want to conquer people. And that's been the nature of men. And we find that again in Matthew 24, there'll be wars and what? Rumors of wars, and, and we've had that constantly throughout our history. Now, each time Syria attacks, Elijah sends a warning to Israel's king and say, okay, the king of Syria is going to be at this spot. Don't go there. <laughs> and so he avoids it. And he doesn't go where the Syrian king can ambush him. Now, I want to note two things here at this point. Is number one, even though Israel's king is not a godly man, God is still concerned about Israel. So even though, secondly, even though Syria is attacking one ungodly king, attacking another ungodly king, God still is upholding the covenant. It won't be for another 60, 70 years that God said, that's it. And it's going to remove them from the land. And so God is still showing his mercy. We have that over in Romans chapter 2, where it says, why does God show you mercy, O man, that you might know the goodness of God, that you might come to him? And of course, not many do, right? But he shows the mercy of God because you never can say that God's not, not, not a merciful God. And so we have here, so Israel avoids the place, and this happens two or three times. The Syrian king calls his servants and says, okay, okay, which, tell me which one of you are for the king of Israel. In other words, he suspects what? Yeah, he has a spy. Somewhere he's got a spy. Somewhere he's got a spy. And, and uh, one servant who's apparently in the know says, uh, oh, king, none of us are for the king of Israel. Elisha, the prophet, tells the king of Israel what you whisper in your own bedroom. <laughs> and so there's two lessons that are not learned here. And these are the two lessons I want to emphasize. Number one, the king of Israel should realize since Elisha is given this information that's true, that's from God, that he is dealing with the true God of the universe, and he should get rid of his idols and submit to this God, right? I mean, it's obvious from the things, I mean, going all the way back to the healing of, of Naaman, all these things, God has shown that he is the one true God. The second thing that we see here is the fact that the Syrian king should stand and say, wait a minute, if, if his God can tell uh, Elisha, what I'm doing in secret, he must be the real God. He must be the true God. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's upset. He's going to decide not only he's going to fight Israel, but of course, in the so doing, he's also going to fight against God. <laughs> and so we, we've seen this over and over again. For example, Pharaoh, right? You think after the 10 plagues, Pharaoh would get the message, right? <laughs> In fact, I think after the second or third plague, he should have gotten the message, right? But we see this over and over again. If you oppose God, you are not going to come out on top. <laughs> you know, God shows over and over again that he's the one true God and that we need to submit to him. There are three astounding traits, man, that always has baffled me, even within my own heart. First of all, the stubbornness in the face of evidence. Um, I'll, I'll admit to you, I have a difficult time with, uh, with dealing with those who, who are just wrestling with doubt, even though you show them evidence after evidence, because I grew up in such a way, my mentality that what God's given me is, if this is true, well, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never been one who, I've had long prayer times, but I've never been one to, 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 to wrestle with God in prayer because I believe that God says, if you ask, you will receive. All, all I have to do is ask. I believe that. <laughs> because God what? He says that. And so the stubbornness, if evidence points one direction, oh, uh, that's where you 
should head. And to me, it's totally silly for men who are going out, spending billions of dollars to find life on a barren planet like Mars. <laughs> or we have found this star way out there, 57 light years away, that has this planet around there, and we think it's an Earth-like planet. Like, what? <laughs> India might have life on it. And, 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 and what, what did India just do? They landed a probe on the south pole of the moon to see if there's ice down there. If there's ice there, had, there has to be a possibility of life. Well, I'm sorry, there's no atmosphere on the moon. I mean, life needs what? Some, some you know, respiration and water and debris. I mean, just cause there's water doesn't mean there's life. You know what it means if there's water? It means there's water there. <laughs> I mean, think themselves wise, they become fools. So first of all, the stubbornness in the face of evidence. Secondly, pride in the face of certain judgment. To me, one of the most astounding scriptures in the Bible is Revelation chapter 16 and verse 9. After all the plagues God has poured upon them, and it says, and they still would not repent. I say, what? I mean, I mean, if you take a look at chapter 16, there's like four plagues just mentioned in that one chapter. This plague came on. Then, then the angel opened up this, uh, this uh, seal and then opened up the, and, and they still would not repent. I, it's hard to explain, don't you think? I mean, uh, that, that's kind of stubbornness, kind of pride. The third thing that puzzles me in the trade of men is defiance of God in the face of imminent destruction. I mean, you have people who are going to stand before the judgment seat who will still curse God right before they're cast into the lake of fire. It, it, that just is mind-boggling, right? I mean, it's hard to understand that uh, this whole attitude, I will not submit. You know, I remember witnessing years ago, I worked in a shoe store, a children's shoe store, and witnessing to one of the co-work young ladies. Uh, and this young lady says, I could not submit to a God who would demand that I would obey him. I thought, what? And she doesn't even realize she is obeying all kinds of things following. That, that, to me, that was one of the most astounding things out of the movie Nefarious. You probably never have seen that it was made by the same people that made that uh, God not God's not there, dead. Um, and the demon is explaining to this psychologist, he's in jail, and the guy is about to be executed, the demon's going to go into someone else. And the demon's explaining that we could not submit to this God, that was enslavement. I say, wait a minute, you just got yourself enslaved to Satan. He's a better master? Like what? I don't understand that. You know, listen, no one is truly free unless you're in Christ. Because if, if you submit, you are free, and if you're free, you're free indeed. All right? And so those things are to understand. I mean, the Syrian king should have said, wow, I mean, this God is, can, can tell this prophet what I'm saying in secret? Well, that must be God. He doesn't do that. Well, there's really king saying, wow, you know, this must be really the true God. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of all my idols. You know, one of the things that Gene and I did on vacation was to go, of course, to Philip's church. You know, his commute is horrible. It's like, it must be at least 20 steps next to the church. I mean, he just, <laughs> and so it goes next door to this church that, the church was founded in 1828. And uh, anyway, they had Japanese missionaries there. And they said, even those who convert in Japan still do all the rituals, you know, that they did in Buddhism and Shintoism. And it's hard to get them away from that because they're so accustomed to it, right? And they're so afraid, you know, what their relatives are going to think if they don't do that. And so 
they haven't got rid of their idols. It's very difficult. And so, so this stubbornness, so men can never say that God has not given enough evidence. Did the Syrian king have enough evidence? Absolutely. Did the Israeli king have enough evidence? Absolutely. But evidence does not guarantee response. And you know, I've had people tell me, you can show me all the evidence you want. I'm not interested. I don't understand that. If something is true, it's true. And by the way, that's what the devil's done with the whole, this whole postmodernism thing, is there's no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is in the eyes of the beholder. Well, try that when you fly a plane. Oh, let me do it my way. <laughs> Try that when you do surgery. I mean, you know, there's certain things that work certain ways, and that's the only way it works. So without a desire to worship the Lord, no amount of evidence or chastening will work. I've always said there are three types of people going to run into when you give a witness. You're going to give one in seekers, scorners, right? You have seekers, and, and, and you have scorners, and then, you, of course, you have the third category who are going to oppose you, you know, the, the, I forget what S I use for that one, but anyway, uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm no, skeptics, that's the other one. You have seekers, scorners, and skeptics. And a skeptic, you want to change into a seeker, right? And then you have an opportunity, but if you have a scorner, most of the time he's not interested. Half of your witness is over, if you just get them to listen, right? If you can just get them to listen, then you got, you're halfway home. If you, at least if they reject, at least you gave them the evidence to make a decision, right? And so without a desire to worship, and a desire to, to bow the knee and serve the Lord, no amount of chastening or evidence is going to impact someone's life. And so we see this over again. Pharaoh, right? Uh, all the plagues and everything else. The Pharisees? What did the Pharisees see? Well, they followed Jesus around. They saw miracles. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Oh, we can't allow this guy to keep doing this. Uh, Herod? Herod surely had enough evidence. You know. Matter of fact, what did Paul tell Agrippa? He said, these things weren't done in secret. <laughs> It wasn't like this was hidden in the closet, right? And so there is enough evidence, but without a heart change, there's not going to be any change in the heart. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson that we have here. Not only the floating axe head, but also this stubbornness of these two kings, one in Israel, one in Syria, not to submit to the obvious evidence that you provided for them. Lord, just bless our time of discussion, Lord, and may your will be done amongst your people through Jesus Christ. Amen.